You have a latte. Oh, man. <laughs> thank you for being here. And thank you for welcoming me so warmly. It's been a really, it's been a joy to be here. And I'm, I'm sort of back in my own heartland in some ways. I, I grew up in northern North Dakota, so you don't have to worry about being cold. I get that. I'm very comfortable with the weather. Um, I'm going to just uh, get off my text a lot tonight, so I hope I don't get lost. Um, I hope you'll be patient with me. But I wanted to begin by reminding us of some of the things we talked about this morning. So I want to start with the, say that throughout history, the church, I'm going to move my slide a little bit so you have a nice image to look at. Throughout history, the church has valued pictorial and visual art for many reasons and used it to accomplish many different purposes. But at this morning's lecture noted, pictorial art has not always been considered appropriate for worship spaces, and sometimes it has been prohibited, regarded as potentially idolatrous. Whether worshipers encounter pictorial art in a liturgical space has a lot to do with their tradition, local traditions as well as historical and ecclesial. But as I argued earlier, the question of idolatry is complicated. Historically, Christians did not regard the art that depicted biblical narratives as idolatrous. They avoided statuary and even portrait type images at first, perhaps because they saw them as too much like the cult images of pagan gods. That changed over time. I'm not going to address tonight why or how or even when that happened, but I want here to consider how artists function like biblical commentators or exegetes in their image making rather than in writing homilies or commentaries or sermons on scripture. So to start from where we left off and to fill in the gaps for those who could not be here earlier, beginning in the third century, artists began producing pictorial images mostly showing favorite biblical narratives for Christian burial spaces. This is what we mostly have. You might know about the Roman catacombs, but also for their stone coffins that more wealthy Christians could afford to build or to buy and, and carve wonderful stone tombs and burial places for themselves. So what you see here, and I guess you already got to see it a little bit of a preview, um, is the catacomb of St. Priscilla. It's one of the earliest uh, chambers in Rome of a burial place for a Christian. And it's an interesting mix of images that, and the ceiling is kind of hard to make this out, but that round sort of now looks like more like an oval circle with a good shepherd is at the top of the ceiling in a small room. And um, on the left, actually, you can sort of make out this, there's a man in a white garment and he's pointing at a flaming, uh, actually it's an altar, it's been cut off. And there's little Isaac, it's Abraham and Isaac on that side. And on the right, you can see the three young boys, the Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace with the dove flying over their heads, which is supposed to represent, I think, the fourth person that Nebuchadnezzar sees when he looks in, I hope you all know your Bible story. I'm counting on that because <laughs> I'm here at this wonderful place. My students would not know that story. But um, anyway, so that's the three use in the fiery furnace. And then um, you can see things like peacocks and doves. And the woman who is the central figure here is possibly the woman who was buried in the tomb. And she's in the position of prayer. So we have a mixture of um, birds and peacocks, and but then Old Testament stories as well. And if you come in this chamber, if you ever get a chance to, the first thing you walk under is an image of Jonah coming out of the mouth of the sea creature. So let me show you another example. Um, this is also a little bit later, but again, often in the ceiling is going to be the image of the Good Shepherd. Why the Good Shepherd is the tomb, and the shepherd is the guide of the Christian soul through the, to the underworld and into, and, and into the waiting period before the resurrection. It's not actually, and I would caution people, because this is always said um, in art books, that this is Jesus. It's no, it's the good shepherd. <laughs> it's a metaphor for Jesus. It's a character of Jesus, because he says himself in the, in the Gospel of John, I am the good shepherd. But he doesn't really mean he's a shepherd. Um, and so he's talking about who he is. But you can see there some images of Jonah. Um, on the very left is, a, I know this is hard to make out, but it's Jonah going over the edge of the boat. And over on the right is Jonah in this position coming out of the mouth of the monster 
And in the bottom is a lovely, and they're all, Jonah's always naked, um, and he's lying under his gourd vine. Um, so we get that image. And I would say this interesting detail on this is that in early Christian art, we have Old Testament images first, four to one. And only gradually do we get images of Jesus. Um, so we have a lot of these stone sarcophagi. Um, this is the Vatican Museum. It's the Pio Cristiano, Pius Christian Museum in the Vatican. And these are just some of the, um, these big, huge monuments that you see all carved. And here's another instance of one that's in there in which we can see um, many images kind of pushed together, um, biblical stories. So up in the upper right is uh, Jesus raising the dead Lazarus from his tomb, and his Lazarus' sisters are there. And then under that, you see a big sail, and that's Jonah's boat again. And you see Jonah going naked over the boat, over the edge of the boat, into the mouth of the waiting monster with the curly tails. And Jonah comes back out again, and he comes up in a beautiful reclining position, quite a lovely naked man. Um, he's, sort of, he's actually sort of inspired by a, a Greek hero uh, by the name of Endymion, but we don't need to go into that too much right now, but that's how they, they depicted him. And then above is, can you, see, can you make out this little guy in a box? That's Noah <laughs> in his little box. He doesn't have any animals. He doesn't have any sons or wives, the son's wives or his own wife. It's just like a jack-in-the-box. And that's how he's always depicted. And above all of that is Moses striking the rock in the, in the wilderness to feed the Israelites the water. And this is probably, the very top image is probably actually um, Jesus' uh, post-resurrection appearances to Mary and Martha, to the two women on the, in the Gospel of Matthew, all pushed together. And so the question is, how, what is, the, what is, the, is there a plan? Is there a compositional plan for this story? What ties these images together? Well, one thing to keep in mind is that this is somebody's tomb. It was probably a very important person's tomb might have even been a bishop. Um, and so you, oh, way over on the left, you see actually a fisher, and you see another person bringing fish. There's a water theme to the whole thing. Could this be, in fact, all about baptism? Um, I'll say. So we're thinking about the ways that Christians, early Christians, are going to be using biblical imagery um, to create a kind of compositional, crowded message that's a a message about deliverance, it's a message about salvation. Pretty soon we're going to see a lot of images of Jesus healing. Um, and so we see again in this one, where the two men in the front are probably the men who got buried here. They, they paid the big bucks for the object, so they get the big real estate. But um, up there again is Lazarus, and there's Moses receiving the law. Abraham um, on the upper register, we call this. Just to the right of the shell-shaped scene is Abraham and Isaac. And if you notice something interesting, it, you see Abraham with his little head on the, hand on the head of Isaac, he's raising his knife, it's been kind of lost, and the hand of God is telling him to stop. The next scene over, can you, you know who that is on the upper right? That's Pilate, washing his hands. But there's no Jesus is Abraham and Isaac. It's Isaac who is Jesus in this instance. So we're putting these stories together as a way that Christians interpreted the Old Testament stories as prefigurations of things that would happen in Christ's life or in their own uh, practices like baptism. And so we start to see that artists are doing the same things that biblical interpreters are doing. And down below we have a wonderful guy standing there, naked, in the middle, <laughs> in this position, that's Daniel. And you know why it's Daniel? Is it's got these two lions. Now, this is a very odd Daniel, because he's naked. And my belief in this one is Daniel is naked because he's also prefiguring Jesus as a resurrected one. Um, Daniel goes into the lion's den. Dari, King Darius comes in the morning and rolls away the stone from the lion's den and finds Daniel alive. So Daniel becomes a figure of Christ's resurrection. But let's all keep remember that we're looking at somebody's tomb. So he's also the figure of the person in the tomb who's being resurrected eventually. So this, 
I'm, I can't go through all of this, but I'm trying to give you a sense of what the artists are already working with the way that exegetical homilies and sermons and commentaries and interpretations are working for early Christianity. Um, by the middle of the, and we have, we, oh, this is also a very famous, I showed this this morning, this is an, a painted church from the middle of the third century. It's actually a baptismal room in Syria in which we see all kinds of images that probably have to do with baptism. The women coming to the empty tomb, perhaps, or maybe the brides coming to the tent of the bridegroom because the one to be baptized is a bride. We have, over the baptismal font, we have actually, it was hard to see this as a good shepherd, Adam and Eve, um, because we're washing off the sins of Adam and Eve and joining the flock of the shepherd. I mean, it's, it's a very thoughtful composition, all of these images fitting together. By the middle of the fourth century, churches and their furnishings then were more and more adorned with painted, woven, carved, and mosaic renderings of Bible stories. Such images also turned up on domestic or personal objects. Clothing and jewelry and gold glasses like these, these were little bowls and cups. Pottery lamps, gold um, ceramic tiles, rings, all kinds of things. By the sixth century, portrait icons and illuminated Bibles began to appear as well. The first were definitely devotional and not narrative images. The second, the Bibles, were paired images with texts in a more direct way and so necessarily were more beholden to narratives than the biblical figures in earlier artifacts. An intriguing reference to this kind of work and a story that points out certain interesting questions about how an early Christian would have viewed artwork comes from a fifth century bishop Cyril of Alexandria, very famous guy, in a letter to a less famous bishop, Acacius Sisopolis, in which he asks how an artist would portray a lengthy biblical story in a single image. So, this is from Cyril. If someone, des someone of us desired to see the story of Abraham portrayed in a picture, how would the painter represent him? Would he do it in a single painting, showing him doing all the things mentioned, or in successive pictures, and distinctly, or in different images? Abraham, for example, in one picture, sitting on his donkey, taking his son along and followed by his servants in another one, again with the donkey, staying behind, down below, along with the servants, and then Isaac being burdened with wood, and in a different painting, Abraham again in a different pose, and so forth. It would not be likely or at any rate probable that one could see him doing all of these actions mentioned in a single painting. Given the example of God's testing Abraham, Cyril then wonders how does an illustrator show all of the events that led up to the moment of the would-be sacrifice? Might Abraham first appear in the donkey? accompanied by Isaac, and then by the servants, and then kindling a fire, and then binding his son, and then brandishing his knife? That would require showing Abraham in several different guises and performing all kinds of different actions sequentially. But this would lack, even then, many narrative details. So if one believes that a pictorial rendering should faithfully represent the unfolding of a complete story, the only possible solution is the one Cyril imagines, to show each scene episodically, like a graphic novel or a comic book. But in reality, Bishop Cyril would never have seen such a thing. If the surviving early Christian images of Abraham about to sacrifice Isaac are representative of what he must have seen, what we have is a simply a single captured moment. Abraham raising his knife and the hand of God stopping him from the act. Several decades earlier, before Cyril wrote that letter, a different bishop, Gregory of Nyssa in Turkey, also described seeing images of Abraham about to sacrifice Isaac. And this is wonderful. We don't have, I tell you, we don't have very many texts where people describe artwork from the early church, and these are really precious. So this is what he said about his experience. 
Many times I have seen this tragic event de depicted in pictures, and I could not pass by the site without shedding tears. So clearly and evidently did the art present it to my eyes. Isaac, kneeling, his arms behind his back, facing his father to the, and to the altar itself. The father, standing behind him, grabs the son's hair with his left hand and brings it toward himself, and with the right, points the deadly sword. Already the point of the sword touches the boy's body when a divine voice calls forth to prohibit the act. Now, when I first read this text, I was surprised by how close Gregory's description matched the early Christian depictions of the scene. I was also conscious that Gregory's knowledge of the story was crucial to the way that the image affected him. He did not see the lead up to the event, but he knew how it came to pass, and he knew the ending, the appearance of the ram and the son's deliverance from death. Because of this, because of his knowledge, he could have a more complex reaction to the image. It moved him to tears, the father's agony, the son's pity, the relief at the divine intervention, which of course is not shown in the artwork. You have to know the whole story. But all of that is conve conveyed in a single illustrated moment. The viewer must fill out the before and the after. So here's one of my favorites. This is Rembrandt's painting of the same scene. Okay, so we're, we moved ahead a great deal in time to the 1630s. And you can see how a viewer, if you didn't know that story, would not know what to make of that incredible painting. But you, you know, you're getting moved to tears. And this is exactly how artists worked in the early church, when they decorated their walls and their tombs with biblical images. They did not illustrate narratives. They chose a moment in the story to evoke the whole, to symbolically remind the viewer of the tale the viewer already knew. This is essentially how depicting stories in pictorial art then differs from telling them in words. Verbal narratives unfold over time. They have beginnings and middles and ends. But visual narratives function differently. In most cases, they are perceived more or less in a single glance, even if a viewer lingers over certain elements. And that's why I always cringe when somebody reminds me of Gregory the Great's famous dictum that Bibles are for the illiterate. Bible, the pictures are for the Bibles for the illiterate that suggests to me that pictures are only for children or the uneducated. But the problem with that is also that you can't be uneducated and understand any of these pictures. You have to be, at some level, learned. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be at, you know, college educated. You just need to be knowledgeable. You need somebody to tell you the story. But I do have to share with this one with you. So these are the famous texts from Gregory the Great. And you may have heard them. And they're repeated all through the Middle Ages. And even John Calvin refers to them in kind of a dismissive sort of way. But um, so anyway, there's, there, there is the real Noah that we, with all the animals in the ark that we are kind of more used to. But without viewers having some comprehension of the source narrative, as I'm saying, from reading or hearing, Illustrations are subject to almost infinite possible interpretations. For example, unless a spectator already knew, as I've said, Isaac's story, and why an old man would be brandishing a knife over a child's throat, they would have no way of intuiting God's initial test of the father and the ultimate deliverance of the son. Now, no one who is uneducated in their Bible stories would be able to tell you who this is. Now you know, because I just told you earlier, this guy standing in a box is Noah, <laughs> and that dove is bringing him the olive branch. But you would not necessarily know that unless I had told you that. It would take you a while to figure that out, possibly, because it's not what you're expecting. Or this, as I've just also shared with you. There is Daniel, and he's always naked in Roman art. That's actually Jesus raising Lazarus. And we can talk later, if you want to, about why he's hitting him with a stick. But um, <laughs> anyway, 
Um, thus, short of captions or other verbal aids, images must fail to convey the equivalent of a textual narrative. Now, that does not imply that images are inferior to words. Rather, it demonstrates that they serve a different purpose. Viewers of art perceive rather than read. But nevertheless, the grammar of reading often pertains when discussing narrative or pictorial art. This is fortunate and unfortunate. First, fortunate because artworks based on literary narratives are essentially exegetical. They're interpretive. They present a the interpretation of a story or a scene, albeit in a, in a nonverbal and more subjective mode. Unfortunate because they often are assumed to be literal presentations of the story, like the most exacting illustrations. Okay, so I studied illustration for two years in New York, and, and some of my, my fellow students were going to be medical illustrators, right? So they had to be exacting, or maybe the instructions you get for putting together some piece of IKEA furniture that you just ordered. That, that's different from what we're talking about. That's um, the work of an illustrator, in a sense, who has to give you directions. But granting that an art's task is more to interpret a scene than to recount it visually, one may validly pose the question of how effectively it does it. At the most basic level, pictorial depictions of scriptural narratives must sim might simply be visual aids or teaching tools, helping viewers to recall stories they have heard or read. But that's a very limited analysis, and it's to misunderstand the role of art and the work of the artist. Visual artists amplify and expand certain features of the narratives they depict. This aspect of art making is not an exercise in accuracy. It's a work of invention and exposition. It is like Lectio Divina, in which one is asked to enter a scene and make it alive and make it yours. Some of you here may be familiar with the Ignatian exercises, which basically do some of the same kinds of things. Read the story, enter it. Ask yourself what's happening. What is, you know, what is the Virgin Mary wearing when the angel Gabriel comes to her? We're going to see this in a minute. What did it smell like in the, in the stable when the baby was born? <laughs> how, how close to the animals are we anyway? And that kind of thing. Artists not only don't have to be literal, they simply cannot be. First, a painting or a static work of sculpture, not a movie, must convey a whole story and suggest an interpret a whole interpretation in a single frame. To do this, an artist must first decide which moment to show, which moment is the most key to the meaning they wish to convey. Artists focus and edit and compose a narrative, distilling and then expanding it. They must portray all of the details that the narrative necessarily lacks. Where does this take place? What's the physical surroundings? What's the environment? What are the characters wearing? What do they look like? Who else is present? For example, as I just said, where was the virgin when the angel Gabriel came to her? Was she in her bedroom reading her prayer book, like here? Or is she drawing water from a well or tending to her spinning? So this is kind of wonderful. This is a famous painting of the Virgin Mary. Um, we call it the Merode Altarpiece. And we see her in a lovely Dutch dining room, right? <laughs> in a beautiful red velvet dress. And she's got pretty nice Delft china and copper pots and um, you know, a nice little window with some heraldic you know, in images in, the, in, the, in stained glass. Um, so, what's going on here? Or we could contrast that with something that tries to be more literal. The Virgin Mary was a Palestinian woman and she lived in the first century. What should, would she look like? What would her bedroom have looked like? Maybe that's what we should picture. Of course, that's an interesting view of the angel Gabriel, isn't it? Is it just a beam of light? Or just have a look at this one. <laughs> what are 
artists thinking? Does an artist actually think that the Virgin Mary had saddle shoes? We're putting her in modern dress. That's not because the artist doesn't know better. It's because the artist has something to tell us. So this goes far beyond literalism. No Dutch artist from the Golden Age or the we call the Northern Renaissance, believed that the Virgin Mary lived in a cozy house with nice dinnerware and copper cooking pots. Certain details must be omitted for the sake of the composition, but others must be added. For example, was Paul riding a horse on the road to Damascus? <laughs> Does not tell us in the Book of Acts. But we got a lot of Paul on a horse on the road to Damascus. So over the centuries, artists decided that he must have fallen off his horse when that heavenly light struck him. And perhaps this is one of the best examples of that. <laughs> New Testament scholars, I, I, I suspect, find it difficult to imagine Paul on such a large and handsome steed. <laughs> but anyway, so we have Paul falling off a horse, and I can tell you, I. People really do believe that Paul must have ridden a horse on the road to Damascus, mainly because of this famous painting of Caravaggio, which is in Rome. Or the Magi. Now, first of all, the Gospel of Matthew does not tell us how many Magi there were. It just tells us how many gifts Magi brought. But we're always going to have, almost always going to have three. Now, that isn't always true. We sometimes have four in early Christian art. But mostly we have three. And they dress them like triplets. <laughs> so you will always see this. You will see these three lovely uh, young boys in leggings and short tunics and little floppy hats, and they're carrying gifts into presenting them to the child on his mother's lap. Um, this is a, another version from the early 5th century, and we have um, the very fancy outfits, right? They're really lovely. They're all in full color. Wouldn't you like those leggings? I really would. And um, lots of, you know, uh, but again, three almost identical. You can get them different colors. Um, I would like to point out to you that this is actually an instance where Herod has a halo, which is kind of interesting and problematic. Um, so the halos are kind of interesting developments in Christian art, and Herod doesn't get them all the time, but he does get them here. But over time, we start to see something happening with the three magi, okay? So now they start to become from different races to represent the different continents, Africa and Asia and Europe, and three different ages. Why would we do that? Because in early Christian interpretation, the magi are the universal recognition of who Jesus is. And the gifts that they bring rec recognize rep are representative, although Matthew doesn't actually tell us this. This is already interpreted very early in Christian tradition. The three things that he's going to be, priest, sacrifice, and king. So they bring gold and frankincense and myrrh for those reasons. They come with camels. They come with retinue. <laughs> um, they, you know, and then the three different ages. So they, they are the three different ages of humanity, right? So we see them as old man, middle-aged man, and young man. In some traditions, they are supposed to even have seen all three persons of the Trinity when they looked at the baby. So you're watching, this starts to be expanded, the art starts to expand and show you how already Christian exegetes have interpreted this story. And they do this themselves. This is one of my favorites of this type. Um, so the sumptuous trappings contrast with the dress and demeanor of the shepherds and lend majesty and splendor to the scene. I can go back to this one if you want to. I can, we have shepherds here. But, and are completely different from the minimal information we find in the Gospel of Matthew. Rather, artists in pictures, like exegetes in words, draw upon the intertextual sources. And so the camels and the gifts and those sorts comes from Psalm 72 and the book of Isaiah, chapter 60. So this is, this is for Chris's son. <laughs> Who decided that Jonah was swallowed by a whale? <laughs> and when did that happen? I still don't actually know. 
But everybody tells me that Jonah was swallowed by a whale. How many of you think Jonah was swallowed by a whale? No hands. <laughs> there weren't any whales on the Mediterranean Sea. <laughs> whales are a northern Atlantic thing, you know, so it had to be in the Middle Ages sometime. The, the story of Jonah is he's swallowed by, a, in Hebrew, a sort of a big fish or a big creature. And so it's already something that we start to see the ways that we read in to our traditions and our artwork, our own cultures and backgrounds. Artists then must use their materials and tools and talents while they manipulate not just the details of their images, but the light and the color and the texture and the shape of their work. I like, oh, there's another Jonah being swallowed by what is actually what you see until really quite late is Jonah. Jonah's creature has teeth and ears and a curly tail and paws. <laughs> Looks like a little like a griffin, like a griffin, griffin kind of monster. So here we have an artist at work. Artists by necessity go beyond the written narrative, incorporate their own ideas about how it should have looked, add dimension and relevance to the story out of a visualizing practice that might have been guided by tradition, but also by personal vision. The artists illuminate stories. They do not illustrate texts. Thus, artists convey certain ideas about the context or meaning of any particular episode. And this could be inspired by any number of factors, from personal reflection to dogmatic propositions. They could also choose to expand the story's basic narrative to more contemporary concerns. Like good homilists, good preachers, artists expound a story's meaning, but in a visual mode. Yet despite the various ways artists manipulate their images, no narrative art can completely sever its basic connection to its source without losing its purpose, which is to interpret the story. Bible stories might inspire interpretations, but they are not just handy springboards to say, just anything. That would be unfair to the text and unfaithful to the project, just as the preacher must not wander too far away from the basic message of the scripture. Thus, although artists may intentionally diverge from the text, include incongruent elements like Paul's horse or Mary's red velvet dress, their basic purpose is to engage the narrative as well as to expound upon it, often in socially and ecclesially, ecclesially relevant respects. I'm gonna give you one kind of final example. So you saw the three U's in the fiery furnace a little bit earlier. And that, through those three U's, now if you notice something about these three guys, this is a depiction of them on a fourth century sarcophagus in which they are um, not being burned at this, in, in, the, in the fiery furnace yet. They have re refused to venerate Nebuchadnezzar's statue. Okay. Now, one thing you will notice is they're dressed a lot like those magi. <laughs> okay, so they're Babylonians. And that's probably not insignificant. They kind of come from the same part of the world. The magi come from the east. These guys are in Babylonia. So we have them dressed similarly, but I don't think it's an accidental similarity. I think there's something important about the three that look alike. And often they're even juxtaposed with each other so that sometimes art historians get mixed up and actually mislabel them. Um, but this is the three, you, uh, three Hebrew U's from the book of Daniel, refusing to venerate the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. But if you'll notice, that's not Nebuchadnezzar's statue as it's described in the book of Daniel. This is the bust of a Roman emperor standing on a column, or a plinth, as we would say. And that's the emperor over there telling them to venerate the statue. Now, that, doesn't, that isn't the way the Daniel story is told in the Bible. So this is already the artist in the fourth century making the point that these three Hebrew Jews are prototypes of the martyrs, the early Christian martyrs, that refuse to venerate the emperor's statue and thus go to their own deaths for that. So we're bringing together a contemporary story. Pretty interesting, early fourth century, since it's not too much after or before when the emperor himself become Christian. 
But we're connecting this story, and one thing that happens is that when you suddenly realize that they're also pointing to the three magi, is they're saying, we'll worship the true God and not the false God. This is another example of that. Um, so, okay. So these artists have explicated the story in a certain way. They give it an angle that others would not necessarily have considered. They make connections and they make associations. They instruct, inspire, and prompt us to reflect on the meaning of our sacred stories, not just as we've always known them, and not literally, but in new ways. So in conclusion, and I'm going to Artists are only half of the interpretive process. Practitioners, whether writers of commentaries or preachers or catechists or liturgists or artists, also expect that their individual viewers, readers, or listeners will find their own meanings in what they see and hear and read and find them both intelligible and meaningful in their own times and places and contexts. Um, I'm going to skip ahead to this one and tell you that I ended a short article recently on how Martin Luther King used the story of the three years repudiating the statue of the emperor and drew upon this famous song, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, of, of, supposed to have been African-American roots, to talk about the resistance to idolatry in, the, in his own time and place. So again, the stories come back and they, have, they serve their purposes in new and important ways for us. Thank you. Thank you. That's nice work. Thank you very much. Um, we've come to the time where we have uh, an opportunity for engagement. We have uh, a couple of microphones set up if you'd like to come and add make a comment, ask a question, kindly introduce yourself, uh, ask a nice focused question, and uh, Professor Jensen will then engage you. So please, uh, let's get right to it. Thank you. Don? Oops, thanks so much. I'll hold it instead of uh, straining my back. I'll put it back there, promise. Uh, thanks so much, that was great. Uh, I love how you ended with an anti-imperial theme, uh, which is uh, a favorite subject <laughs> of mine, so I love that. Uh, and I saw that thread, actually, in, in your remarks. Uh, but my question is this, uh, maybe one more note of appreciation before the question, which is, I, I like the way in which you did not oppose texts and pictures, because both assume a sense of community belonging, someone passing down a set of stories. I really appreciated that as well. Uh, my question is, as you said towards the end, that uh, there's a basic agreement on the basic meaning of the text, or something like that. Uh, and I noted that the Abraham and Isaac story was making a repeated <laughs> entry in several slides. Uh, and I actually used that in several of my courses, uh, courses especially the Rembrandt and Caravaggio representations of the Abraham and Isaac story, to actually ask if there is a basic meaning of the text that is being challenged, right? So, so my question to you is, so for instance, is the Abraham and Isaac story essentially uh, a story about obedience to God, or is it uh, a reaffirmation of the commandment, thou shall not kill? Right. Uh, so, so the question is, is, is there really a basic recognition of a meaning? Like, is there a basic meaning? Are there, are there situations in which you have encountered art as actually disputing a basic meaning? Yeah, that's, a really, that's a really complicated and wonderful question. Um, let me think for a minute about that. Um, Hmm. I'm not sure. <laughs> I, have to, I, I haven't really been prepared for that question. I, I'm, I'm, I'm really loving that question. I have to think about an example of it. Um, I can give you one from a different kind of, of, of place. Um, and this is not maybe at all going to be an answer to your question, but it's another example. Um, and it has come from architecture. That um, one of the ways that we know how Christians practice something like baptism is to look at the spaces in which they could do it. 
and we're told one thing, and we find out that that could never have happened the way that they said it did, because the spaces wouldn't have accommodated the kind of practices that they're described. In other words, you can't really immerse a whole body in most early baptismal fonts. I don't know if this is exactly what we're looking for, but I'm looking at another kind of example of that. Um, I think that in many cases, I don't think that faithful artists working with biblical stories would necessarily want to contradict the story. But I think they might want to trouble the story. And they might want to trouble our, our sometimes our ingrained habits of thinking about the story. Possibly, maybe now that I'm thinking, one of the examples that I mentioned earlier this morning was um, the way that we have a kind of image of God as an old man with a long white beard. Well, that probably is something we need to trouble. And, you know, of course, you know, you will have people saying, oh, we never depict God. God is invisible. <laughs> well, we do it all the time. You know, European art is filled with images of an old man with a long white beard. In the same way that we often see Jesus as a Caucasian, you know, hero figure. And, and when people tell me that we shouldn't do that, we should be sure to depict Jesus as a Palestinian man who lived in the first century, so we're being literal and historically accurate. I'm going, well, that kind of closes off what an artist is up to, too, because that's not what the artist's work is. So there's nothing in my mind that would preclude a Jesus who's Chinese, or a Jesus who's African, or a Jesus who's South American, because that's what artists are telling us, and we're not we're not going to say that the Virgin Mary has to look like a Palestinian woman living in the first century or in a nice hovel. Uh, we can put her in a Dutch dining room, but if we can put her in a Dutch dining room, we can also put her in an African tent or, or in, you know, a, a Nick Blue or something else. I don't know, you know, so there's a real possibility for breaking open our ideas and opening um, and, and not following the text too literally, or any other literalism that we want to have. I, I don't know if that's an answer, but I'll try that. <laughs> uh, my name is Peter. Um, you said, I think, early that Jesus does not appear in the art in the first few centuries. And I, have a, I, I can speculate on a reason why, but what, what have you figured out? You can speculate on a reason why he... I, I, I have my own speculation of why he doesn't show up in the early art, but what's your analysis? Well, nothing shows up in art in the first and second century, really. Okay. Um, we don't have any Christian art for two centuries um, that survives that we can identify as specifically Christian. When Je the earliest images of Jesus, and this is sort of interesting, um, and maybe I'll see if it follows your speculation, but the, we dominantly get Hebrew Bible stories. Old Testament scriptures. Jonah, Noah, Daniel, Abraham and Isaac, Adam and Eve, Moses, all over the place. Um, the Good Shepherd is, I don't think, exactly a depiction of Jesus. It's a reference to Jesus and who Jesus is. The first things we get of Jesus are Jesus being baptized and Jesus raising Lazarus and Jesus multiplying loaves. That happens sort of toward the end of the third century, as far as I can tell. And then suddenly in the, we get a lot of Jesus, okay? And we get what we get, okay? This is, I didn't, they didn't put this in the text, but this is me. What we get are Jesus healing the blind man, the paralytic, the lame man, the woman who's got the hemorrhage, the, um, the uh, exercising the demon, the leper, and so forth. Raising Lazarus from the dead, raising Jai Jairus' daughter from the dead, raising the widow's son from the dead. We get Jesus multiplying loaves and fish. We get Jesus changing water to wine. We don't get Jesus crucified. We don't get Jesus in the manger mm. until the fifth century. <laughs> mm. The things that we think are so much the standard Christian artwork, we don't have those. Some people will say that's because Christians really didn't believe in that stuff. They didn't really care about the crucifixion. They only cared about the healing stories. Well, I don't really buy that. I think art does something different from the creed. 
the creed, if we think the old Roman creed is really the old Roman creed, and I think it is, goes back maybe to the second century, born to the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate. Where's the middle? <laughs> okay, the middle's missing. We get that middle in the artwork. We get the ministry of Jesus, we get Jesus as a teacher, we get Jesus as a healer, we get Jesus as a wonder worker. We don't get Jesus as a, as a victim. Or it, we don't get a Last Supper, we don't have an ascension, we don't have transfiguration. I know. So I haven't really got a great theory for all of that, except to say that the art is doing something different. And it's in a place in which we're also sending a new kind of message about Jesus as a deliverer from death and disease. And I offer my speculation. <laughs> the early Christians were so steeped in the notion that you do not have images of God, right? Uh, the, of uh, God. Yeah. And so you were very hesitant to depict Jesus, God incarnate. And maybe the first stage of that is you depict Jesus doing very human actions rather than these salvific events. So that's just my speculation. Um, we get enough Jesus, so I don't think they're, they're, they're inhibited about showing him. There's an interesting church in Ravenna in which it's, it's actually late 5th, early 6th century, probably late 5th century, in which we have on one side of the church, we have all these images of Jesus calling the disciples, working miracles, healing people, and so forth. And on this side, we have the Last Supper all the way to the post-resurrection appearances. It's like the division of the story. And I think it fought, and this is my theory about why this, and one side Jesus is beardless, and one side he has a beard, which is also really interesting. <laughs> And some art historian has said, oh, it's because when he's working all those miracles, he's more divine, and when he's, when he's going through the suffering and, and all that stuff, he's more, he's more human. I said, no, it's the other way around. It's the other way around. Over here, he's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the gospel of John. These are his signs, and he has not yet come into his glory. When does he come into his glory in the gospel of John? Well, John doesn't have a last supper, but it's that moment when he begins the passion. And that's when he's glorified. So I think there's a lot of theology. And, and you're, you're not wrong to be thinking theologically with me about this. I think you're right. That we have to think about my contention, and I'm kind of a lone voice in this, is that Christian art is theologically informed. It's not just whatever. My favorite Bible stories. It has a theological grounding. It's telling us something that's sophisticated. And I miss that in so many histories of Christian, early Christian art. They just label the scenes, you know, this is Noah and that's Jonah, and well, ask why. Why is that there? But why is Daniel naked? <laughs> it, I don't know. Hi, oh, oh, I just popped it out. Hi, my name is Julie. I'm a fourth year student here. Um, I noticed you were focusing mostly on Europe and Middle Eastern art, or um, like art around Jerusalem, that kind of thing. I was curious when we started to see Christian art pop up in other places and what they would focus on. So for example, Thomas the Apostle, we tend to trace to India. When did Indian Christian art start to show up and if I'm wondering if they would have focused on different stories um, or if the development looked different there or in Africa and things like that that's my question oh. um, we're really in a later time period um, and so I think what we do get is so much influence of Biblical stories still, and influence of European art motifs in non-European art. Um, and, and, but in the 20th century, we started to see people really focusing on an in, 
and you know, enculturating, I can't think of a better word for this, so that we start to see you know, Jesus looking like um, an Indian man, and we might see, I can think of, um, oh, I can't say his name, an Indian artist who does a lot of wonderful Christian painting, and he has a strong focus on stories like the prodigal son. Um, and I think he does this because he believes deeply in what Christianity can do for that, that you know, divi divided culture. But that's what an artist will do. And I don't know if I can speak in some kind of global way about what all artists might do. Um, I, I think there's so much use for art to speak to the, tra the traumas of our culture, um, to use these stories and use these images to, as healing images, as peacemaking images. Um, I think this is a, a really interesting and wonderful example up here. Um, so that, you know, it's, it, there's just no limits to what one can do. Um, you can be unfaithful to the story, but I don't think there are any limits to what you can do with that. I want to come back and say one thing about, as I was, as I was trying to answer your question, um, often people will th and this has been said, the reason why Christians have so many more Old Testament stories than New Testament stories is because they were influenced by, the, by, the, by Jewish art. <laughs> And these are Jewish paintings, really, and they're, they're drawn from a so-called illustrated Bible that must have existed, and a, a, a Jewish Bible. We've never found that Bible. <laughs> There's plenty of Jewish art. But I don't think that's the answer. It's to keep in mind that the, what, we would, the Christian, what Christians would call the Old Testament and what Jews would call the, the Torah is, is the Christian Bible, too. <laughs> And, and for them, that was the stories they read, and they, but they interpret, they interpret them through the Christian lens. And um, you know, whether that's a good thing or not a good thing is sort of up to the listener, but it is their story too. That Moses crossing the Red Sea is a type of Christian's baptism. It's, you know, it's already in, the, in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians <laughs> where he talks about that. So I think there's a way in saying, it's not that these were Jewish stories and these are Christian stories. I don't want to do that. That's something we call Marcionism in our, in our theological language, to sort of cast the Old Testament over there and say that's something that doesn't apply. It does apply. It's the Christian Bible, too. My name's Andrew, and I will pick up on the question that you asked us to ask, which is why does Jesus have a stick when he's approaching, why does Jesus have a stick with Lazarus? <laughs> Thank you for asking that question I actually asked. ask. Um, so this is very often called a magic wand <laughs> in our text. You'll find this in sometimes, you'll, just Google it. I mean, I, I did the other day because I'm, I'm revising my book on early Christian art. And I, for some crazy reason, Googled Jesus magic wand. And there's like stories all over the internet about Jesus and his magic wand. Um, and this is really important because magicians, as far as I know, there's almost no depictions of magicians from the, the third century. Um, and they didn't carry wands, as far as I know. They didn't pull rabbits out of hats either. So it's not, it's not a magic wand. Um, it, I think it's a staff of power. Um, it relates to Moses' staff, um, and it's, it's something that is a, it's also an artistic device to demonstrate what he's doing. Now, it's really interesting, and this is often not noticed, that when, sometimes it is, but not most of the time it isn't, that Jesus only uses it in certain circumstances. When he's raising the dead, Lazarus, Jairus' daughter, the widow's son, or when he changes water to wine, or when he multiplies loaves. When he heals anybody, he, he puts his right hand on the spot on the blind man's eyes or on the, the head of the woman with the, with the hemorrhage, um, or, um, or he speaks. He does it with his hand. So it's a kind of interesting distinction, but I, I, <laughs> but I, 
But people, it, it, people always notice this thing that they call a magic wand. <laughs> it's not a magic wand. I'm Carl Coop. I teach here. Um, a question I have is um, when we get to hermeneutics and the way people are interpreting scripture, um, you've got differences um, in different regions. You know, uh, we'll talk about the Antiochian school or the Alexandrian school, uh, and appar apparently or evidently their hermeneutical approaches are different. Um, so, can you talk about difference or similarity? I mean, um, are there tensions between various uh, regions or um, areas within, within the early church or kind of competing hermeneutics that's going on? You're, you're talking about interpretation as if it's, one it's, it's, not, it's not all one thing, I, I, yeah. or is it? Like, <laughs> is, is there a kind of a tension between uh, different, different interpretations? Um, say, if you could say a little bit about that. It's a really good point. And the problem I have is that we have almost no art that isn't from Rome. So I have nothing to compare to. And that's, a, that's something that I, I should have said right off the bat, because most of our Christian, early Christian art, until we get really into the sixth century. And there's some that comes from Milan, you know, there might be some that comes from Ravenna and sometimes Constantinople, but it's still not going to be enough to sort of give us a really big contrast. So I have a hard time saying that I can see differences, but that not, wouldn't say that there weren't. There, probably, there might well have been. And we just lost what existed and I think we lost it. I think there was plenty, but it might be buried under the train station in Antioch somewhere or something. What I can say is that, and it, not what you're looking for, but sometimes when I talk about the ways that there are different types of interpretation, so there's the kind of historical, literal interpretation of the story, this really happened, and it's, you know, Adam and Eve really, you know, this is, this is what happened. And then there's the beginning to do a typological interpretation where these are all prefigurations of something that's going to happen down the road, or there's, you know, Isaac as a prefiguration of Jesus as a voluntary sacrifice. Um, and you already see that in the New Testament where Paul's talking about, you know, we're, the, is, they were baptized into Moses and into the Red Sea and so forth. Um, and then in First and Second Peter, Noah becomes the type of baptism as well. Um, and then you get a kind of allegorical, anagogical interpretation. I think all of these can apply to Christian art. And I'll give you an example in which I think it works. Jonah. So the story of Jonah in the book of Jonah is a very complicated story. It has a, be has a beginning and a middle and an end that we don't see in Christian art. We don't see the beginning and we don't see the end. We don't see anything about Nineveh, either end of the story. Doesn't, there's nothing there. What we see is Jonah getting thrown overboard, dumped in the mouth of the sea monster, and coming out and being cast up on, on land and being reclining under a leafy pergola. No no dried up pergola, <laughs> no sulking Jonah. That doesn't show up. Now, if we think about the sign of Jonah that Jesus gives in the Gospel of Luke or Matthew, there's two of them, I forget which one is which one. It's a sign that the Son of Man will be in the earth three days. So in a way, already in the Gospel stories and put into the mouth of Jesus, Jonah is a type, perhaps, of Jesus or a prediction. So we can say, okay, the images of Jonah are a reference to, to Jesus, Jesus' death and resurrection. Except we see it on a tomb of a Christian. So are we then taking it to the next step and moving it into the sort of allegorical meaning in which Jonah is a representation of the soul, of the dead person who is then into the, into the death, into the depths and then coming out of the depths and being rescued by God. How? And then let me take a kind of ritual interpretation of it, which is if Jonah is cast into water and comes out of water, he's baptized, just like the Israelites were baptized, according to 1 Corinthians 10, in the Red Sea. So we have, 
How do you get to be resurrected from the dead if you're Jonah or if you're the dead person in the tomb? Well, I was baptized and therefore I'm guaranteed resurrection in the next life. It's comforting to the person who's coming to look at my burial place. So I think that all those levels could be operated. I don't yet know how I could actually look at the contradictions between different schools of thought, but I'd like to. I wish I could. Hi, my name is Chris Hubner, and I want to follow up on this um, Jonah type of Christ resurrection theme, and, but focus it on the naked body. Um, right? You mentioned that Daniel and Jonah are typically uh, depicted naked, and your reason for that is that they're types of Christ? Or, Person. or the baptized person. Okay, so I'm thinking um, in, so as a juxtaposition of last judgment paintings, right? It's the juxtaposition of... Last judgment paintings, oh, okay. naked bodies in hell, clothed in heaven. Yeah. Um, and, and then the assumption is that the clothing is a depiction of the resurrected body. Hmm. Um, and if that's the case, then how does the naked body depict the resurrected body of Christ? Um, but then you just kind of gave a clue of that with, yeah. with the, you know... Um, you you, you, but you've jumped ahead a few centuries for yeah. me. So, yeah. um, and, and if you think about something like, um, oh, what's his name, the painting in um, Orvieto, um, <laughs> where the dead are coming up out of the mm -hmm. earth, they're naked. Yeah, always, well, almost always. Yeah. So, um, and it's not that nakedness is vicious <laughs> and, and being clothed is virtuous. One of the things that's really interesting is that, okay, naked people in early Christian art, this is one of the topics. <laughs> Adam and Eve, which makes some sense, mm -hmm. okay, and Jonah, and Daniel, and sometimes Lazarus. Sometimes we have a little Lazarus. I'm trying to see if there's a better one here. Um, and there's a really beautiful naked Jonah here. Um, so nakedness, first of all, I think has to do with birth. And, um, and so this is, early Christians, you may not know this, but early Christians were baptized in the nude. Um, not a stitch of clothing. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is sometimes a shocker for people, but and so and that's in a sense to sort of in and the and the and the font is the mother's womb filled with water. And so you come out of and you because you also get baths in in naked. You're not you don't get into bathtubs clothes. Most of us don't. But so there's a sense in which being naked is being reborn. And Jesus, of course, was also naked to come out of the tomb because we left all the grave clothes in the tomb. We don't like to show that. We don't like a lot of naked Jesus, but we, you know, you think about it. And so there's a sense in which nakedness has to do with returning to the state of innocence. And so even prior to Adam and Eve's fall, when they didn't, we didn't yet were aware, aware or ashamed of their nakedness. So I think there's a sense in which the nudity of the body is a way of showing a, the return to innocence, the return to being reborn. And so often, and then what happens often in these images of the little healing images, and you can see here, and they're not naked, but you see that blind man is small. Um, up there, Isaac, of course, he's a boy, he's small. Um, really very often when you'll find images of Jesus healing, the figures that he's healing are going to be small figures. And my theory about that is that because they're healed, they're returned in some way to a childlike state. And so that's why they're shown as small. Now, an art historian will tell you they're shown as small because they ran out of room. <laughs> I don't think that works. But I think this has got to be some other explanation. And the other person who's shown as naked and small and as childlike, chubby, often like baby, like a toddler body, is Jesus at his baptism. I wish I could show you that. And uh, maybe I could tell somebody I can find one on the internet and show you somebody. But it's just constant. And it's really strange. We know that Jesus was 30 when he was baptized. I mean, the Gospel of Luke tells us that. But we get him depicted as a small, nude toddler. <laughs> and I think it's the same thing. I think it's what's working is we're not being literal about the story at all. We're saying Jesus is like us, and when we're baptized, we return to the state of childhood, a child innocence. 
So those later medieval paintings are a different discipline? I think that's a little different going on. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I, that was a long answer, long answer to the question you didn't ask. <laughs> yeah.